Good morning, my friends. Good morning. As my mentor, Katie Geneva Cannon, used to say, the time we know now, we will soon know no more. Uh, this will be my last time at the podium with you. Um, and tomorrow in our final convocation, you will be blessed with the closing plenary um, by Dr. Juan Floyd Thomas. So we are going to do high impact meta-ethics today and let me see if I can rely on Kairos rather than Kronos and try to jam-pack everything into this blessed hour that God has so freely and mercifully given us. Consider with me, as we just heard, that we are suffering not only from a pandemic disease but a syndemic where we find ourselves wrestling in flesh and blood by powers and principalities. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile with, with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise, we sing. But oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. Today's lecture is entitled, Deliver Us From Evil, also known as Undoing What History Has Done. If I were to quote Beverly Wilden Harrison, mother of feminist liberation theology, the gospel according to, take a deep breath, critical race theory. Ready? Hold on. You recall that on the first day of class, we talked about the ethics of faith, the ethics of lies, the ethics of people trying to discern axiologically or morally what is valuable in society on the one hand or what is good for them morally on the other. And in discerning this moral tightrope, there's an algorithm that has our heart spinning out of control as we deal with the emotions, the philosophies, the mother wit, perhaps, the reasoning, the culture, and who or what is sacred. We not only go through this, Everyone around us goes through this. And now, the more and more we depend on technology to stream not only the word of God rather than hiding it in our hearts, but every opinion. People rarely go to their mothers anymore because Google knows best. And before we can figure out what we want to eat, what we should buy, we believe as we gaze into our smartphones, our iPads, and our computers, Google lets us know, right? In the same way, we get trapped by the input in the ways it gets lined up with what is normative. Before we know what we want, we're told what we yearn for. I want you to understand 
That is what sin is. When something that is a good, like information technology, it is a good. Who remembers Texas Instruments? One of the proud things coming out of Texas. When, when it, it, it assists you, am I right? But what happens when you have that Texas instrument and forget how to do long division? Yeah. You become what? Dependent. So that which you use to do good does what? Is a good that ends up using you. That is sin. Where life is supposed to be what? In service to a God that provides. But when the good gets trumped by the goods, God ends up being in service to us. I want that to be the perspective. If there's one thing from this week that you walk through the world with, do not be caught up in, do not be blind to race, gender, and class, because it exists. But look for the image of God in the diversity of humanity, the equity of humanity, and the inclusion of humanity. Because in so doing, you get rid of the kingdom and you facilitate a kingdom of God. You do less raising now and you bring more heaven down to earth. This is the gospel truth, bringing good news on bad situations for people who find themselves bent over, broken backs against the wall, wearing a mask to protect them. As we go through this algorithm of all those different questions, it's not like we do it within a norm, in and of itself, within a vacuum. But we have all of these things happening within us. When we talk about culture, when we talk about public, when we talk about the polis and the political, we're talking about attitudes, beliefs, languages, customs, rituals, behavior, faith, food, right? Think about this when you think about culture. And think about the same ways you use that calculator without learning math. How do you use a culture of other people without learning about that? I don't know about you, but I cannot get through a week without eating Chinese food or Mexican food. In fact, I think I'm one of the best Tex-Mex cooks out there. My enchiladas beat most enchiladas I've ever tasted. But I struggle with my Spanish too. Never, never tried to learn Mandarin Chinese. We consume people's cultures with, to nourish us, but we starve our minds and our souls huh? from the very things we consume. What would we do if we took Derek Bell's advice? If you are not fully going to engage that which you consume, don't touch it. We talked about what would happen if we had a day of absence of the people we ignored. We then would realize what essential work is. Nobody understood this better than those of us who are clergy because when the church of brick and mortar Closed because of COVID. <laughs> Forsake not the assembly. Had to take on another meaning. The spirit of God had to go outside of stained glass walls. What was sacrament? 
all of a sudden it wasn't so necessary. Because to live, to breathe, and have your being, when everyone around you is falling apart, is sacrament. In the same way, many of us have been walking around. Oh, when are you born? This is when I was born. Oh, you're an air sign, right? What is your Enneagram sign? Oh, you are two. I'm an eight, right? All of these different ways of what? Creating algorithms. Huh? So we can pick. What is it that I like about you instantly? Or what is it about you that irritates me? The same way, all of us, also have inclination towards cultural paradigms. Some of us are warriors, right? We, we, we go into, and it might be how you were educated. I was educated at Vassar College in the liberal arts you know, institution where we were told to challenge what we read. So when I read a text, I'm ready to tear it up. I'm ready to devour it. I'm ready to know more than it, what is considered good. I'm running all the way. I would, ever since I was in second grade, I had Bloom's taxonomy on the wall of my classroom. And so I knew the lowest level of thinking was recall, which is why I was always able to outpace my colleagues growing up who thought the highest level of thinking was just to repeat what the teacher had said. The same way, some of us take that very disposition, then we say, as soon as we see something, we want to attack it. We want to see the crisis, rather, we want to compete, right? The, a culture of war, that, that where we're warriors. And remember, when I was talking to you about the taxonomy of the academy that only existed of mathematics, religion, and philosophy, that, this, that the warriors were who? The, the middle managers, actually, that protected the invisibility of those who were in power. To attack anybody, anything that goes up against the norm. Or are you a part of the culture of peace? You go into a situation where you see conflict and conflict is crippling. You numb up, you shut down, right? You, you want to cooperate. You want a life affirm, right? And you are the builders. And then there are those who exist in the culture of transformation. This is what we, as clergy, must be. You do need Warriors, you do need builders. But why do they need to be affixed to people programming us, right? As a culture of healers and trans transformational people, we need to see that wherever there's conflict and crisis, there's what? Opportunity. And I would say, wherever there's crisis, there's Christ. Right? Ontologically, crisis makes us look for what? The reality of Christ in our lives, the metaphysical reality. And we are called not again to be, as I was saying yesterday, the H I M of Christ. Give up your messianic complexes. Come off the cross, come off the throne, take your capes off. We're called to be the H-E-M. We are called to give people the faith to find Christ for themselves by living in such a way that our testimony shows we too have been tested. We too have been tried. But we all can be delivered from the evil in our midst. We all wore, if we were to tell the truth, 
If I were to take time and go around the class and have everybody to tell me what your name is, what it means, who named you, and how does it make you feel, that's the meta ethics of a name. Some of you would get angry. Some of you would beam with pride. Some of you would be ashamed. Some of you would go to Google to figure out your name, even though you're 62, because you never knew. But what all of us would know, that before we were formed, before we were in the functioning of humanity, someone named us without consideration of who we were to become. And we have wrestled our whole entire life living up to, in denial of that or renaming that name. There's so much we don't even know about our name. Can you believe that? Yet we want to judge other people that we don't even know. If we were to mind our own business as a starting point of wrestling with our own demons, if we took that same algorithm of faith and realized our own race, how are we raced? That's what we see going on in the Ukraine. And Russia, that, that it's not just about pigmentocracy, that race does have something to do with ethnicity. And part of the reality within America that makes the racial continuum being honorary whiteness and dishonorable blackness is that white people and black people have both been robbed of their history in large part. Because the history of the world in which we live, if we were to quote, and I'm forgetting the person who said this, America would be grand if every Irishman killed a black person and got hanged for it. That's the history. That's the history, right? Because if we were just to look at whiteness, how Irish, Irish used to be the black people of the white race. Polish. Just like any other virus. What are we learning with, about Corona? If you don't attend to it, it will outsmart you. Because the virus does not want to die. So what does it do? It finds a way for you to live with it. That's sin. How many people have seen the Shingrix commercial? The Shingrix, the, the shingles vaccine commercial? It, is, it has been evangelism in our house. It has brought our 13-year-old daughter to Christ. So the Shingrix commercial, you have this person who's been running around 15 miles. I just ran 15 miles. And then it says, shingles doesn't care. Oh, I bench press it. Shingles doesn't care. Oh, I just made this on the stock market. Shingles. It says, whatever good thing you think you've done for the good of yourself, this shingles virus doesn't care. Coronavirus has taught us what? It is not a respecter of persons. We can create codes and regions and zip codes and state a nation states, but what? Oh, we are realizing we are in a web of mutuality. What impacts one impacts us all. And that outer web, there is an inner web. And so many of us need to go to the instruments of society to tell us what to do because we can't deal with the webs that are spinning. In, our, in, in the attics of our own souls. This is why intersectionality is important. Intersectionality is the in, in, interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, gender, right? And we can go on and on as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Through an awareness of intersectionality, we can better acknowledge 
and ground the differences among us. This is very important. Diversity is not just difference. Diversity is looking for the divinity within humanity that finishes that missing part. One of the things that we're bemoaning in theological education, particularly with our Christian and Protestant clergy, is that there is so much shame, so much seduction of culture, shame of the ignorance of one's own religious heritage, that people are afraid to enter into interreligious dialogue. I mean, I mean, I, I felt that way before. How many people have felt that way before? But it's when you engage the other. When I am around somebody who is practicing pure land Buddhism, I learn as a Christian what peace that surpasses all understanding should look like. When I'm around someone who is Muslim, who attends no matter what the circumstances, to pray, with their face facing God and their body in surrender to an authority that I realize the discipline of the fact that prayer can change things by changing me first. When I am around another Jewish person, I realize how forgiveness cannot be cheap by forgetting. And that how to say never again is a resolve to recommit oneself daily, not only to a covenant, but also to a confession that one does not deserve a new year until they confess their sins one to another. There is no shame in how God has created you. The sin and the shame is how you have allowed what is evil, the good, the instrument to supplant the good in you. Therefore, it's important when we engage ourselves, when we engage our congregations, when we engage the word of God, when we seek to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth as the good news, that we deal with the religions of people. This is the very first generation that we've ever had that's been unchurched within Christian history in America to deal with age. What does it mean to talk always to the middle-aged congregant among us and then wonder why the youth are not coming? The racial realities, the ethnic realities, the gendered realities, the different and dis and temporarily abilities in our congregations, the sexual identity. And here we're talking about orientation. Here we're talking about preference. Here we're also talking about physiologically. And the economic class, knowing that class in and of itself is not just about money, but also about portfolio and pedigree and what you do for leisure and who your friends are and where you are educated. All of these identifying cultures are things that you cannot miss if you want to meet people where they are and take them to where they need to go. First, as theologically educated and trained clergy, we need to realize that there are embedded philosophies that orient our approach to the word and not just to the world. You know the first time that you took a biblical exegesis course and then you went to church and tried to preach it. And they said, well, who is Herman the eunuch? 
and you were talking about hermeneutics, right? And I don't know about you, but we have a sister Hubbard and she's like, baby, make it plain, make it plain. Call and response helps you. It lets you know when you lose your way. And most of the black Baptist preachers, we just, you know, put Jesus on the cross, bury him and raise him up again in three minutes to resurrect our sermon. But before we get to the word, before we rightly divide, the, you all know, all of us have a safety, right? To pull that, right? To pull that emergency straight. Because all free is going to happen after the sermon. What is that operative philosophy that you approach the word to, with? Are you p- using the cojito, right? The Cartesian logic that says, I think, therefore I am. I went to Princeton Theological Seminary. I went to Vanderbilt Divinity School. I went to Bright Divinity School. I went to Lutheran School of Theology. I went to Fuller School of Theology. Are we believing that institutions, make us that just because we have our degrees there's something divine within us i think therefore i am it it, it is a kind of greek mythological solipsistic masturbation where zeus just thought himself athena no woman needed If we only think that our thinking makes us who we are, then we are disembodied, neck up people. Or do we use an Ubuntu, West African proverb, that I am because we are. And there's this web of mutuality where I am tied to you and you are tied to me, which is good unless Everybody only is like you. Or do we practice this Jewish Bubarian theology that Mendel talks about here? If I am because I am, I, and you are because you are you, then I am I and you are you. But if I am because you are you and you are because I am I, then I am not I and you are not you but we are something greater. Huber calls that the I thou. And that's great too, unless everybody, the I and the you looks like you. You see how that works? There's nothing perfect. What do we know about the truth as clergy? The word, the letter, kills but it's the spirit that gives life there is no plug and play you all there is no cheap exegesis or cheap grace you have to work this when i do premarital counseling right you know you're you're sitting there with, with two eager people one thinking okay you know, I've saved up the three month salary for the ring, <laughs> oftentimes. And the other one just so excited because she gets to say yes to the dress. And then I say, you don't say I do once. You say I do daily, even when you don't want to. It's that spirit that has to be at work in our call. Each one of these philosophies have their brilliance and beauty, but when taken outside of the diversity, equity, and inclusion of the spirit of God falling afresh on us, it doesn't produce faith. It produces fictions that become lies and the incarnation of evil dwelling among us. In other words, we need to examine the implicit bias in our midst. Implicit bias occurs when somebody consciously rejects stereotypes and supports anti-discrimination efforts, but also holds negative associations in his or her mind 
unconsciously. Scientists have learned that, the, that we only have conscious access to 5% of our brains. That's why you better not just use your brains. Much of the work our brain does occurs on an unconscious level. Thus, implicit bias does not mean that people are hiding, for instance, their racial prejudices. They literally do not know they have them. Many of us might have killed people. with the coronavirus, because we what? Didn't know we had it. I want you to understand that's how implicit bias works. The coronavirus, because we didn't know we had it, right? So, so intentions is what? Not enough. Intentions are not enough. We have to ask ourselves, what are we willing to do to scrub ourselves clean? To daily wash ourselves, to cover ourselves, to keep at distance those things that might be on us that we know could very well contaminate. The work, our position in office, our relationship with our congregation. They literally do not know they have them. More than 85% of all Americans consider themselves to be unprejudiced. Yet researchers have concluded that the majority of people in the United States hold some degree of implicit racial bias, is what racial gospel says. And I would add to that, not just implicit bias with regards to race, but with regards to class, ability, sexual orientation. The list can go on and on and on. Implicit bias is when you're consciously against prejudice but your unconscious actions seem to suggest otherwise. Remember that picture of, my, of, of me at six years old? And I just couldn't understand why we were singing the song in church. That didn't line up. While we were preaching a liberation gospel, but we were profiling people, all black congregation, that did more profiling. That was implicit bias. After you've been a part of a people who have been hypersexualized, vilified, demonized, disgraced, seen as ignorant, lazy, or subhuman, any representation of that in your imagination would be something you had to extinguish. When the peril in our lives becomes problems. They end up possessing us if we don't wash ourselves clean of it. And they become piety and pride that imprison us. Implicit bias is institutional racism. We've seen it. I call it the portfolio of exclusion, the portfolio of inclusion. Kevin Johnson, Jamal Johnson, same exact resume. When Kevin has something on his CV, good, good, good. When Jamal has it, well, really? Was he affirmative action hire? Did he go on scholarship for football? Like whenever people see Dr. Juan, he hates it when I give this example. I always have to give the example because it works with implicit bias. Six foot four, tall, right? Hulking black man. Most of, one of our very best friends 
for the last 20 years, every time he sees me, he's like, and he really likes basketball. He said, man, I can't believe he didn't play basketball. He was a National Merit Scholar at Rutgers. Never played a sport with a ball. But it creates dissonance to the point that he said, that's a whole lot of body going to waste. And he didn't mean that. Oh, I mean, I'm sure many of us, women in the room, oh, you're, you're, you're so attractive. You, you, you sure you want to go into ministry? You think you're going to be able to get a husband? That's implicit bias. And no harm really is meant by it. It's how we are programmed. Implicit bias is institutional sexism. I mean, this is satire. But it ends up that simply you're not the right man for the job when you're a woman, whether it's pastoring a church or being a leader. Right? When we talk about affirmative action on uh, campuses of higher education, what is it that we think about? race, right? But does anybody know the highest form of affirmative action, like really affirmative action? Because racial affirmative action is actually limited by quotas, but does anybody know who actually benefited the most from affirmative action? White women. Does anybody know who actually benefited from the practice rather than the policy of affirmative action? Legacies. George Bush could not get into the University of Texas, so he went to Yale. Do you know why he went to Yale? His daddy went to Yale. Do you know how affirmative action by practice, by implicit bias, presently operates in higher education? If all admittance to the best colleges and universities in the nation were based on merit. Do you know what the demographics would look like of the student body? Hmm? It would be 80% women and heavily Asian and Nigerian. But we couldn't do that, why? 80% women on a, oh no. It's, the implicit bias says what? It has to have male equity. So much so that we don't even ask the question. Do you, do you see? Implicit bias as institutional classism. How many people are middle class in the room? All right, majority of us. Guess what? There's no such thing as middle class. We have been identifying ourselves based on a lie. You say, why are you saying that, Dr. Floyd Thomas? I'm saying that because 93% of American wealth is owned by the smallest majority of people. When we are talking about the middle class, you see that 7%? You see that 7% right there? That is what 80% of the American population. We, most of us are fighting for 7% of the pie. And you're like, oh, well, I'm not in that. Oh, yes, you're in that. Is there anybody in here who's making over uh, $500,000 a year? If you are, let's talk afterwards. And if you give me a tithe or an offering, you know. Well, I have a $1,000 check line right here. Now, let me not get to my Black Baptist proclivities. But. The middle class is there. We're in the middle of the, the grind in the corner of the dustbin. That's what we're fighting for. And if we fight each other, you see, we'll never know that we are literally being robbed blind. How does this kind of power work? If I were to ask you, and let me just take this back. If I were to ask you, just by groups, if we think about those who are full of power and those who have less power, just like we realize with class, 
Who would you say are full of power according to class? But I mean, just give me a descriptor, like an adjective, a word. The poor, the, the rich, the, the wealthy. Okay? Who are, um, who has less power? Everybody else. See? And what do we, what is this, what do we call that sin? Ism. Yeah, see, we have the, the social ill. What do we call that? When the wealthy have power and everyone else does it. Classism. Right? When we talk about race. How does race work as a capital? Who has more power within the American context with regards to race? And who, who has less power? Everybody else. And what do we call that? Racism. Think about that with people of color. Do you think people of color go around calling ourselves people of color? Do you think Asians call themselves Asians? No. Right? Do you think Koreans and Japanese and Chinese and, right? No, they call themselves according to that, but we just clump everybody together. BIPOC, now we don't even want to say people, BIPOC. What, so, and what do we call that? The sin is racism. Okay, if we were to think about gender, who has more power? Who has less power? What do we call that? If we were to think about sexuality, who has more power? And who heteronormative think? And who doesn't? Everybody else. And what do we call that? Heterosexism. If we're to think about ability, who has more power? And I like to say temporarily abled. Why is that? Because we can what? What? And what do we call that? Ableism. How about education? Oops. Who has most power? Hmm? The educated. Well, what does it mean to be educated? What kind of degrees? I mean, I went to high school. College graduate. Who has less power? I mean, everybody is educated, right? But those who have a limited education. And what do we call that? What do we call that sin? Oh, see, it's really interesting. The sins that we're invested in, we don't got names for them. Right? Didn't I say that when women walk by, right, construction sites or fraternity, there's no word. When we were talking about what does it mean to, to, to be parentless parents, there's no word for those things that kill us. It's elitism. And so if we were to look at this, it's not that we don't know the truth. And if we were to look at the most powerful persons within our middle age, heterosexual, temporary able, Protestant, highly educated, wealthy men. And guess what? None of us in here are that. Because we already realize just by class alone. But guess what? That is what our God looks like. Because we made God in the image of the powers that control us. Do, do you see this? And so our fragility, no matter our gender or our race or our class, and our, it takes a hold of us. Because we're all seeing ourselves in this image. We all feel that we are victimized by it. We have to defend it. Loose that off of you. What it means to live within the American context. I'm only saying the American context because that's where I live. I am not saying to anybody else, right? But it, when, when I'm not giving marital counseling and I'll be talking about another marriage, Dr. Juan will say to me, you know what? He said, why are you wasting your time? You're not giving counseling right now, are you? I'm like, oh no, but I'm so worried. He said, marriage is just like another country. Some people drive on one side of the road and you don't. Your currency doesn't spend there. You don't have a right to vote. You don't have citizenship. So enjoy the visit.
be kind and gracious and lead. Right. So I'm only talking about the American context because that's where I have agency and citizenship. Th this is a part, you know, like when people say, well, we don't have that race problem. Th really? You don't? I, I, yeah, you do have a caste system. There is, there is no society that doesn't have their own demons. But they all are informed by an implicit bias, starting from a, a good but then the goods about it are all that matter. To deny what we just saw is a sin of obfuscation. Power is tolerable only on the condition that it masks a substantial part of itself. Its success is proportional to its ability to hide its own mechanisms. When we talk about class, for instance, does anybody know what I'm saying that it's not just money, bless you, it's not just money that says, that shows you the difference with class, but it's also pedigree, where the closer your house is to the road, you can tell the less class you have. When you know that you're in an expensive neighborhood, what do you know? Well, it's not even just not gated. You're in a whole different unzoned area. There's usually not even street signs. It's hard to get there. The roads curve. You only, you know, you'll just start, just beads of sweat just popping. Right? Feel like you're in like a horror flick. You go into the houses. I don't know about you. How many people just have a whole bunch of pictures in your living room of all the people that you love? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, yeah that's not. When you go into a rich home, If you see something, you don't see pictures. You see paintings and you don't see paintings of anybody living. It, think about it. When you think about the Rockefellers, the Carnegie's, all, do you know what they look like? Even Bill Gates and all of his wealth. That's fast money. That's quick money. You know, he's not even considered higher class. It takes three generations. Did you know that for a class to change? Because you have to get all those other 13 indicators calibrated. Power, but, but names matter. So when you have endowed chairs, named buildings, and, th and this charity, this philanthropy, is so these People possess a power that protects what they have from how it oftentimes has been God. And that is a wonderful thing about philanthropy. I mean, I, I, I believe in philanthropy because it is a way to create equity, balance. It is a way to undo what history has done. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about student loan debt forgiveness. Undo. If we are one of the greatest countries in the world, and those we rival with and see as peer among us have free education, undo what history has done. We have the right not to remain silent but to change course. That's what philanthropy is doing. That is what the very institution where we're standing, doing the slavery audit, is to say we cannot be haunted by our past. You are not guilty for what your ancestors have done. You're not guilty for what people you look like <laughs> have done. You're not guilty for what your parents have done. You're not guilty for what your spouse has done. But you have the responsibility and the opportunity to be the divine difference, especially when you privilege from. Right? That reality. When you do not confront what you know, 
you become complicit, even if you didn't know it, right? Implicit bias comes from culture. I think of them as the thumbprint of culture on our minds. Human beings have the ability to learn, to associate two things together very quickly. That is innate. That's what we do, right? And with each generation, we are now, attention deficit is just not a medical psychological condition. It, it now frames American culture. That the average American cannot sustain attention for more than 15 minutes you're supposed to shift an activity, right? And, and so everything has to come in commercials. Everything has to be edutainment. That, that's part of the difficulty, right? Right? Preach, come off the script. Because you have to be engaged, right? Pastors are being called to be entertainers. Because people need to get it quick need to get it fast. Any person living here, D'Angelo says white person, but I say any person living in the United States will develop opinions about race simply by swimming in the water of our culture. And the reason why I say anybody, because black people do it too. Black people will oftentimes think the same thing that white people think about black people, but if they've been, right? Women, we know that. We call it horizontal violence. It's profiling because then you then you believe in tokenism, and then you believe that oh, it's by the grace of God that you're there. And since there's only one woman's seat, if there's only one BIPOC professorship, you need to make sure that you leave all others behind. That that's our culture, right? I want you to do this test quickly. Name the colors of the text on the right. One is excellent. Now do it. Do you see that? How many people had to adjust their eyes? Because it, it creates dissonance. We have the same dissonance when we see people. The exact same dissonance. That's not something to be ashamed of. It's something that you need to recognize. If you go to the doctor and refuse to tell the doctor how you feel, whether you drink or smoke or whatever else, or what, what diseases exist in your family, what condition, can you, what, what's the doctor going to do for you? If you want to save yourself, what do you need to do? Tell the truth. This, this is the nature of our society. We, 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 have, we, we don't hate colors. <laughs> but it shows us that we're not colorblind, that, that color matters that much, that we see color before we, color and words come tied, inextricably bound together. This is implicit bias. So a few key characteristics of implicit biases, implicit associations we hold arise outside of conscious awareness, right? They favor our own in-group. They're a part of real world effects on behavior and they can be gradually unlearned. See, you can unlearn it. If we would have kept on going through those slides, you would have been cured of that. But you have to do that moral exercise. I cannot believe this time so quickly. We haven't even gotten to. Yeah. So a few months ago, Virginia elected and inaugurated Yunkin, Glenn Yunkin, governor. Among many things, Yunkin promised to ban critical race theory. Interesting enough, public schools were not teaching critical race theory at all. We saw Ted Cruz. Right, and literally hazing Katanji Brown as not only a pedophile, a, a protector of pedophiles, but also as a crit advocate. All of the news, we're doing the same things. Why do we see this attack on critical race theory? Why is this a winning formula for political races? 
The answers to those questions are not simple, but require some steady thought and critical analysis that we don't have a lot of time to do, obviously. But if you recall in 1988, now, the 1900s, I know some of you might not have been here in the 1900s, during the presidential election, Michael Dukakis, the Democratic nominee, was ahead in the polls until George Bush used a dog whistle. And the dog whistle was Willie Horton. Dukakis, when he was governor at the time, saw, signed off on a furlough program that allowed Horton, who was a part of it, to be released from his sentence for a weekend. While out on furlough, Horton raped and assaulted a white woman in the presence of her husband. At that point, the, not only did the caucus lose his ground, but even within women and feminist studies, a racial schism broke out where a rapist was always a black male and black women were unrapeable. See, the, the ripple effects. Critical race theory is the new Willie Horton dog whistle that gets people to stop thinking and use the instrument for its own good. What is, Christ what is critical race theory? Simply put, it is a devotion to the full historical record. Repeat after me. It is a devotion to the full historical record. It is an epistemological understanding that context gives you content. Without it, you simply consent with what is being done. And that what is being done is, in fact, the will of God. But as you know, as preachers who exegete the Bible, in order to preach it, you cannot understand something unless you put it in its full historical record. Three major strikes to take down critical race theory. The first attack on critical race theory is part of a larger attack on the enlightenment project of education. People are easier to exploit when they lack knowledge. Critical race theory critiques are fomented as backlash against civil rights, women's rights, human rights, LBGTQIA struggle, and George Floyd protests to go on and on. People invested in supremacy and or the comforts of privilege experience equality as a trespass. If you get distracted with hating something that is more adjacent to your reality, it keeps you from what? Seeing what's really going on. It's a fear tactic that uses a dog whistle to make you afraid. And you need to understand as ministers that fear is false evidence appearing to be real. Fear is false evidence appearing to be real. I have the pleasure of teaching critical race theory at Vanderbilt University with, in conjunction with the law school and um, people in, in Peabody in our School of Education at the Divinity School and my colleague, who I teach it with is now a professor at Loyola College and a Christian who in her confession of faith and transformation realized that she had to walk away from being a legal prosecutor because she was actually convicting and committing to imprisonment more victims of sexual trafficking while she wasn't even allowed to try people who were burning crosses on people's lawns in Nashville because they were seen as kids being teenagers. But she was able to imprison teenage girls who were victims of sex trafficking. And she said it was only in reading Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow and being asked questions in a women's book club that she realized that though she called herself a Christian, she was complicit with evil in the name of the state. And so the students who take our class, obviously, because it's not a required course, are cool students, brilliant students, you know, would think themselves woke, 
across all races. And of course, because that, that Vanderbilt is usually pre predominantly white. One student said, she never felt so ashamed and weak and disempowered as when she saw this picture. She said it made her feel less than. And the class asked, why is that? Did you feel that way when you saw the Bush family with their two daughters? And she said, why not? Why not? It, she was struggling with the dissonance of her logos in the midst of the ethos and the pathos that was arising within her. How could a black family be in the white house? And it's not just this one white woman saying, I know people within the black community who hated this picture. Because if this picture was possible, then it meant that in their mind that they didn't have to be in the situation that they were in. So this picture must be an evil picture. Because why does he get to be there? And I don't. Do you see how implicit bias works? Lyndon B. Johnson put it perfectly. I'll tell you what's at the bottom of it. If you can convince the lowest white man that he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. Be careful of those who will make you believe that heaven is hell. Critical race theory is in need of what Dr. Juan Floyd Thomas calls a critical race theology. We need people to realize that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but the viruses in our midst that are not a respecter of persons that have taken up a resonance and replaced our souls. You have good work to do. Be an instrument of God. The devil needs no more advocates. With that, I leave you with the benediction of Howard Thurman, go your own way, do your own thing, but live in such a way that God nor your people will be ashamed for having made you.